Aloha and welcome to the Two Wheel Revolution here on thinktechhawaii.com. I'm your host, Peter Rossig. This is a show where we talk about what's sometimes called micro mobility or personal mobility. Essentially, that means uh, e bikes, bikes, uh, e scooters, e skateboards. If you want, you can even buy electric inline skates, but I don't recommend it. And uh, this is all about getting around with uh, out a car, either for your daily commute or for uh, the, the last mile or so. And I will, I encourage you to spend the whole half hour with us. We're starting something new today. It's gonna be either called the micro mobility moment or bike bits or something I haven't decided, but at the very end, I hope to give you a little uh, interesting uh, tidbit for, thank you for watching. And we're very fortunate today to have with us uh, Senator Chris Lee. Uh, he is the Senator who represents Kailua, uh, Waimanalo, Hawaii Kai. Uh, he was first elected to the House of Representatives in 2008 and then served six terms there. Uh, I, when he was first elected, he was uh, the youngest legislator. I'm sure he took some ribbing about that, uh, maybe still does. And um, he was very well known there for his uh, very strong advocacy of civil rights for especially for people of uh, all sexual orientations and persuasions. He was also a very strong advocate for progressive policies around uh, climate, environment, and energy, which is where I first got to know him while I was at Hawaiian Electric. And we were, uh, I think we all had the same goals, but we might have occasionally had that different opinions about how to get there. So uh, Chris has now made the transition to uh, the state Senate. Uh, he, his last job in the House was as uh, Judiciary Chair, Chair of the, of the Judiciary Committee, pretty influential role. He's now come over to the uh, Senate where he's Chair of the Committee on Transportation, also a very important thing to do. Chris, uh, Senator Lee, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Oh, glad. thanks. So you've made this transition now and can you tell us a little bit about it, the difference uh, uh, the two secret differences between the House and the Senate, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the difference between judiciary and transportation. How's it going for you? Yeah, you know, um, I, I find uh, first things first in the Senate, uh, people tend to call you back a lot faster when you reach out to a department and ask for help. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I mean, I think in my role actually before judiciary, when I was chairman of the Energy and Environmental Protection Committee in the House, um, there was a lot of overlap with what is today transportation. And uh, we're at a point where I think those two um, sectors of the economy, transportation and energy, are now so inextricably inextricably linked um, that you really can't treat them as separate anymore, especially as we go from you know traditional uh, gas cars to uh, electric forms of transportation, uh, all of it from its funding streams and the way that people interact with it and all that is, is changing rapidly. And I'd argue uh, I think behind energy, which is probably the, the single fastest changing uh, part of our economy, transportation is not only second, but is quickly catching up and will soon be the place of most disruption and most change uh, in the years to come. Yeah, I don't think most people realize that uh, transportation is a bigger source of climate change uh, gases and impacts even than, than electricity, at least here in Hawaii, certainly. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, uh, uh, Oh, go ahead. Well, uh, I was going to ask you about the, what you see as the main challenges in transportation coming up in the next uh, next session, which will start pretty soon, or in the, the next uh, few years ahead as we try to grapple with climate change. You know, it's actually a set of um, really good, or we have some fortunate circumstances. You know, the federal government um, and our congressional delegation and uh, the president have um, passed the Infrastructure and Jobs Act, and now the um, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, both of which have a tremendous amount of money for transportation and energy and climate and all these things that all kind of meld together and really give us a huge set of new resources and tools to significantly change the way that our infrastructure is laid out and the way that people um, commute. But I think the biggest thing is that that money and that that this moment in time where we have this opportunity can't be just pushed through the traditional silos of we're going to do things kind of the way we've been doing them and maybe just double down on that. What we've seen in Hawaii, and this is true in many other places around the country as well, is a, a generational change. When I graduated from high school in 1999, 99% of uh, my, my age group 
had driver's licenses here in Hawaii. Today, that is down uh, almost to 60%. You know, it is, is a market generational shift. Um, and, and part of that is, of course, you know, climate and um, uh, just people wanting to do things more conveniently, live closer to where they work and so forth. But a huge part of it, too, is cost. And, you know, in Hawaii, where cost of living is um, tremendous, everything we can do to reduce that is important. And when you think about transportation, um, for example, the average uh, resident in the, the European Union um, pays about 8% of their annual income for transportation. Here in the United States, it's basically twice that. In Hawaii, it's even higher. So there's a huge place where we can really make some progress. And I think if we can get um, uh, cheaper ways to commute out there and, and empower people that way, that's going to have a significant impact. And I think that's really going to be the big focus for this coming year and how we rethink the way that we spend our transportation dollars, especially now with that federal money hanging out there. So let's drill down a little further. What do you, what would you like to do with that federal money if it were entirely up to you? <laughs> um, well, you know, I think there's there's a lot. I think um, the the obvious stuff that everyone's been paying attention to is um, uh, public transit, and obviously there's there's a huge amount of uh, change there. The city and county of Honolulu is, and all our counties are moving toward uh, electric buses and expanding that kind of bus service. The Department of Education we've been working with, they just provided free public transportation for all students, all, all high school students. Um, we'd like to make sure that um, continues and, and give people those cheaper options to get around. Uh, but also, there's electrification going on. People are moving from gas cars to EVs, which are cheaper, um, just generally speaking, on the whole. Uh, and then, of course, cheaper to maintain and operate because there's way less moving parts. And that's something which is accelerating rapidly. But part of that discussion that we haven't yet had, even here in Hawaii, is um, what comes next. And the other piece of that is uh, getting people options to get around without having to rely on public transportation, without having to own a car and use new forms of micromobility to commute in ways that were never possible even a few years ago. And that's really significant because if you think about it, if we just electrify transportation generally and everybody moves to EVs, it's kind of like putting solar panels on your house without first switching out your incandescent light bulbs to CFLs and reducing your overall load and putting a little bit of efficiency in the system. So we know that based on other places, other cities, other countries, um, a good portion of the population, especially in dense urban areas, can get around um, much more efficiently than having to own a car to drive two blocks, fight traffic, pay for parking, find it, um, just to get to, to work, get to the store a couple blocks away when you could hop on a bike or hop on a scooter or uh, any number of other things. So that's really where I think that third element is that we're starting to take a look at, and that's going to be a big part of the discussion this coming year. And and again, we, to drill down a little further, what do you think? How what form will that discussion take? How will this uh, you know bringing micro mobility? Uh, I hate the word, but it's kind of works uh, into into the the mix. How will that work in in, in practical terms? Do you think? Uh, I think there's really two big elements to it. Um, the first is how do you incentivize these new forms of technology, especially avoiding kind of the um, the situation we face with solar panels, for example, where everybody who was adopting solar at the front end tended to be on the wealthier end of the spectrum and those who were not kind of got left out for a while. So we want to try and reverse that and make sure that everybody has access. And that means, um, for example, we have our, our $500 rebate, which we created just this past year for electric bikes, electric mopeds, things like that. Um, taking a look at expanding that to figure out what else can we do to get people options to get around uh, far more efficiently and cheaply. The second piece of it is um, addressing our infrastructure. None of that matters. None of having bikes or mopeds or, or scooters or anything matters if you can't safely get around in the first place. And our roads are notorious uh, for being uh, dangerous. You know, we unfortunately in Hawaii, other than the, the highest cost of living in the among the highest cost of transportation per capita in the country, you know, we have the some of the most dangerous roads, and we have the the absolute worst. Um, senior citizen pedestrian fatality rate and uh, typical crash rates. They're spiking this year again as we speak, uh, unfortunately. And it doesn't have to be this way. And so question is, how do we use the resources we have, especially that federal money, and retool the ways that we have our traditional state funding of our roads so that we build um, 
roads and sidewalks and bike lanes and paths that are absolutely safe and separated from each other. So you'll never have a situation where a kid has to get on a bike to get to school and is riding down the street three feet away from cars flying by 40 miles an hour. It's just madness. And it's why we have the tragedies that we face on a daily basis here. So that's going to be a big part of what we do. And rethinking that whole infrastructure and the bureaucracy uh, at the state and the counties um, so that we tweak it so that they can do things more efficiently and build things out differently. That's going to be a big part of where we're going. All right. I, I think that, you know, we've had a, a big push in the last few years on electric vehicles, which is great. And we see more and more of them. But what I don't think the we've gotten now, the word hasn't been gotten out sufficiently to say, you know, even if everybody goes to an electric vehicle, that will not get us to net zero. It will not get us uh, clear of climate change. We have to have something else. And as you say, that something else is uh, other forms of transportation that don't involve cars. I mean, electric cars are great, uh, but if it, the electric vehicle happens to be a Hummer, uh, which is thousands of pounds and uh, very low efficiency, uh, we haven't gotten that much further ahead. So uh, I, I think we it's time to start uh, talking. Obviously, that's why I'm doing this show, so we can start talking about uh, about this uh, this question of how do we get beyond beyond cars uh, for many many people. So the question then is, um, you know, electric vehicles have have not been without conflict, have not been without controversy. Uh, now you're talking about taking away my lanes, about you're talking about taking away uh, the place where I drive. You're talking about taking away parking spaces. Uh, do you see there? Um, you fear there's going to be a lot of conflict as we move uh, in this infrastructure and in uh, more more uh, micro mobility, more personal mobility devices. Uh, are you worried about a big uh, culture clash? You know, um, I think in the context that we've had some of these discussions so far, which is cars versus bikes or cars versus scooters or, or all of that. Um, we're at a turning point, I think, where people understand that commuting isn't just about one form of transportation. In fact, it benefits everybody when you have multiple modes of transportation available to everyone. And right now, we spend about 98%, 98% of our state um, dollars we collect and put back into our highways and roads and everything uh, on typical traditional lanes for cars and trucks. Um, yet everybody is a tax-paying resident in Hawaii. Everybody commutes one way or another, and a huge portion, much larger portion, you know, 60, 70 percent of people um, commute in other ways that are not just by car. It's by public transit. It's by bike. It's by all these other things. Some are just pedestrians, and we have an obligation to spend that money to benefit everybody. So when you do that, not only is it safer for everyone, but it also gets people, for example, out of cars. If you can provide for a typical family. And, you know, in Hawaii, things are expensive. And because everything's been so, um, has been built the way it has been over the last hundred years, almost every member of a family has to own a car in Hawaii to get around reasonably anywhere. And the challenge is, you know, for parents, you got to drop off kids at school, pick them up. That means either you got to drive, take time off work to do that, or your kids have to have a car too. And, each time you have additional car in the family, that's like ten to thirteen thousand dollars per year of additional cost. That's like a crazy amount of uh, uh, capital that you know our cost of living here just doesn't support. So if you can empower families and change our public infrastructure so that you can let families choose to go from say four cars for four members of the family down to three, or three cars to two, or two cars to one, um, and give them that option because now they they can get around more more cheaply and more efficiently. Uh, that not only takes cars off the road, which benefits all drivers, but of course, it makes for better commutes for everybody else as well. So it's kind of a win-win. And when you think about your typical street, uh, you don't need to take parking spaces or lanes away or things like that often to do a lot of this. Um, there's a lot of options to do innovative stuff in a space that just hasn't been done in Hawaii and we just haven't seen yet that are being piloted in other spaces. So I think... Um, some of the work the city and county has been doing, um, putting in protected bike lanes, for example, um, has been kind of game changing in a way. 
Um, right now, you know, the state's embarking upon a new experiment. Just this past year, in 2021, um, we changed the law and I, I kind of rewrote DOT's mission. And now their mission is not just to build out highways for you know traditional commuting, but it's also to build out protected networks of um, bikeways and protected networks for pedestrians to get from community to community and finally build out those safe modes of transportation so everyone can get around fairly. And that's really from a taxpayer's perspective, um, finally going to provide some justice for all the people who are out there who either don't own cars or commute by their means and want to see some of their own dollars that they're putting in as tax dollars or paying into the highway fund to go to support infrastructure um, that's a little bit broader that can support them too. I, I hear you, but I also hear people, uh, some of the traditional cyclists, for example, will say, you know, we fought for years to get bike lanes, protected bike lanes. Uh, now we're just starting to get them. And then all of a sudden our space is being invaded by electric bikes, by electric scooters, by uh, these uh, electric skateboards. Uh, do you see some internal uh, conflict there between uh, the various modes of, of uh, e-transportation, if you will? Yeah, you know, there has been. And uh, I think it's an ongoing discussion each time there's a new form of it that comes out, right? And you got electric scooters and uh, uh, one wheels and, and all kinds of different stuff going on, all kind of in the same space. But I think we're, we're maturing a little bit um, in the technology where it's going kind of from uh, what was the early days of kind of wild, um, uh, wild wild west where people didn't know what to do you know scooters were left on the sidewalk randomly and then you just pick it up there now to where um, you have specific designated spaces for for these to go um, i think the conflicts between for example traditional cyclists uh, and uh, people on electric bikes is is finally starting to coalesce into kind of a new norm and that's something which can be helpful for everybody because you kind of we're basically rewriting the rules of the road as we go as a society um, to embrace new technology and innovation. But the great thing is, I think there's space for everybody. And uh, one great example of that I was just in Berlin um, over the summer meeting with uh, the chancellor, the new chancellor, and, and getting to use their infrastructure. And it was my first time in Berlin. And uh, we had a group of Americans and a group of Germans, and we all split up into teams and we we got around the city in different ways. Some were on scooter, some were by train, some were by car or, or an Uber, and uh, some were just walking. I was in the electric scooter uh, team, and we got around the city faster. I mean, it's a big city. We got around the city much faster than anybody else did. And there was space built specifically for this kind of transportation around the city. And so we know it can be done well and efficient. And that's something we just have to think about when we're putting money into our infrastructure going forward. So uh, there is a, a, a room for voices for all these users of transportation. And um, as we sort of get our dollars onto the roadways and into the sidewalks and bike lanes, um, there's gonna be space for everyone. So we're not there yet. So that's where the conflict's coming from. But when we get there, it'll be better for everybody. So your scooter team got there ahead of, uh, of, of how many other groups? Oh, I think there were like eight different groups or something like that. <laughs> All right. It's a great experiment. You know, and I think it's also worth remembering uh, when you do visit places like Berlin, you visit, you go to Copenhagen or you go to Amsterdam and you see this tremendous bike, uh, you know, bike culture. It didn't happen overnight. It happened because uh, some uh, elected leaders primarily said, you know, we can't continue going down the car route. Uh, our city wasn't built for it, and certainly Honolulu qualifies as a city that wasn't built for an infinite number of cars. Uh, so we're going to have to do something else. And, uh, you know, it didn't happen overnight. And it took, in the cases of some of these cities, 30, 40, 50 years. And, I, you know, we don't happen to have that much time. But on the other hand, things are, are changing a lot faster in our world than they were, uh, were back then. So uh, I think it's always, it's always a learning experience to go see what other places have done. And I'm Absolutely. glad you're getting out there and and uh, and coming back here with the inspiration of those kinds of things. So let's talk about the e-bike rebate a little further. That's the main reason I wanted to get you on here. It's really, uh, if if my research is correct, there are only about a dozen states uh, that have e-bike rebates of any kind. Uh, some of them are statewide, some of them are local, but uh, so Hawaii is joining a, what I consider a prestigious group of, uh, of uh, progressive states to do this. And uh, I think you're 
if not the main mover, one of the main movers behind that happening. So first of all, thank you. And second of all, uh, how did it uh, how did it happen? How did you uh, get this going? You know, this actually came out of a much larger um, bill, which would have also provided rebates for electric vehicles and a bunch of other stuff. And at the end of the day, we narrowed it down to electric bikes and electric mopeds uh, for two reasons. One, because um, you get a lot more bang for your buck, right? We're, we're, we're using taxpayer dollars and federal dollars and other things to spend on our infrastructure. We want to make sure that we're doing it most efficiently. Um, a rebate for a car would be, you know, many thousands of dollars, um, which is a lot fewer cars you can fund out of the same pot than you can electric bikes. And we know that the, the real opportunity and benefit, especially getting around places like downtown urban Honolulu, for example, um, is not so much by car, but by uh, these cheaper, more efficient methods, which is why you see all the pizza delivery companies now switching over to electric bikes, um, getting around. It's just faster. You don't have to worry about parking and all that. So anyway, um, we want to start there. And that's not to say we're not going to come back to look at, um, you know, additional rebates for EVs and, and all kinds of other stuff. Um, but but we started with electric bikes and electric mopeds too, because uh, you do have a lot of folks who can't afford cars. You know, for example, university students who need to get around, they tend to buy typical mopeds and you hear them on the highway, sounds like a angry hornet flying by. Um, and we know countries like China and others have done a whole lot of innovation and now switched over completely to electric mopeds. And that's not only improved quality of life in urban areas because it's a lot quieter, um, but also it's a lot cleaner and it's a lot cheaper because you don't have to worry about gas and uh, broken uh, five horsepower engines and all these other things. So um, it just made a lot of sense. And uh, we hope adoption is um, uh, proven um, and you have a lot of people who do subscribe to this. And that's something that I think other places, as you'd mentioned, are now in the first uh, you know, a couple of years of figuring out what those results are looking like. But I think it's safe to say at this point already, um, just in general around the country, that e-bike adoption has been uh, far exceeding anybody's wildest imagination because it's been so popular. Uh, because ultimately, you're taking uh, a form of transportation and simply just making it easier for everybody. So if you live in a hilly area, no problem. If you need to go further to get to commute to work and you don't want to get sweaty doing it, no problem. You know, there's a lot of benefits there that opens up cycling and biking as a form of commuting to huge number of people that otherwise couldn't before. The um, what? I'm sorry. What? Uh, I hope we can put up on the screen the uh, the URL for the State Department of Transportation's page on this. Uh, oh, there it is. There's a page. There's a URL. Uh, it, it seems like there there's a fairly limited number of people who can qualify for this. Would you say uh, that's the result of the political process, or that was thought out as being the best way to start, or or, or why the restrictions? Yeah, you know, um, the the people who can qualify for this right now are folks who are um, low income. Uh, so if you're benefiting from any sort of low-income program whatsoever, you'd qualify. If you're a student, um, you know, in high school or university, uh, you'd qualify. If you don't own a car, um, you also qualify. And that's up to $500 uh, off the cost of uh, an electric bike or moped. Those restrictions are, I think, too restrictive. You know, we put them in there as a compromise as part of that political process. But if we want something to be effective and we want to maximize help for people, uh, especially struggling families out there, you know, I think it needs to be brought in. And that's part of the discussion that's coming up uh, this coming year. Because if you think about it, we're spending taxpayer dollars to help subsidize transportation, especially for those people with this new innovative means to get around. But if you think about what we're doing right now with our money, we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars adding lanes to highways and doing other huge infrastructure projects that we all pay for that really don't benefit a whole lot more people. The traffic doesn't really get much better at the end of the day. You end up with the same amount and so on and so forth. So if instead of spending that much money, we take a little bit of it and actually give people these better options to get around, that takes that many more people off the road and has the same result for a lot less cost to taxpayers. And so it's a win-win both ways. And that's why I think if you expand this, then it's going to be a real game changer and a real win for everybody. Do you think some of that federal money might be pumped into the... Uh e-bike rebate program going forward? 
You know, I think there's totally uh, options for that. There's a couple different pots of federal money that could qualify. And I think um, if this first year of, um, you know, this program rolling out has some positive results, I think it gives us all the justification to kind of double down and say, all right, we're going to make more, more support available. So if I read it correctly, any bike that was purchased after, uh, say, July of this year could qualify, uh, but it might be early next year before uh, the checks in the mail. Is that about right? Right. The department does need some time to sort of stand the program up and set everything up. Um, but qualifying, if you purchase your electric bike or moped after July 1 of this year of 2022, then you'll be able to file um, uh, for that rebate when the program is ready to go. And I, I'm I'm counting on the chair of the transportation committee in the Senate to keep the uh, department's nose to the uh, to the grindstone on that one, right? So Absolutely. what about let's talk for a moment about the neighbor islands. We've been talking a lot about the urban core and about downtown Honolulu. That's fine. Uh, where do the neighbor islands fit into this whole transportation uh, picture, especially the relationship between cars and uh, these other kinds of, of transportation? You know, the neighbor islands are actually um, really not a whole lot different uh, in terms of the potential benefit that they can get out of this whole revolution in transportation. Um, everybody lives in kind of pocket communities, you know, in Maui and the Big Island of Kauai. So within those communities, uh, being able to get around the same way you would here on Oahu, uh, if you're able to have like a short uh, e-bike trip to go visit a friend or what have you, instead of having to get in your car and then fight traffic and go through that whole nine yards, that's a huge benefit, um, just the same. Making sure that infrastructure is built out properly that separates cars from people, from bikes, uh, so everybody has their own safe space, that's going to save lives. And that's a huge part of this whole equation. Um, so um, the other thing that we're working with, um, with some of the departments of transportation at the county level on our neighbor islands, for example, on the Big Island, where um, they're working on a, a pilot project right now where public transportation is just free, period. Like their version of the bus is free to everybody uh, for the next year or two. That kind of stuff opens up uh, new forms of transportation to folks who otherwise have never experienced it before. And in the same way, we're hoping that um, we can help assist the counties doing what they're doing from the state. And states typically have been, you know, kind of a backseat driver to counties that have um, done most of the nuts and bolts road building, but there's opportunity here. We have a lot of the federal money that's funneling through the state so we can provide that assistance to counties to help accelerate their goals here too. I've always thought that if, uh, if the bus were free, uh, or, or much cheaper instead of, you know, the incremental increases that we'd see ridership, which has fallen off dramatically in the last couple of years, as you know, it would shoot right up and we'd have to, uh, we'd have to have more buses in a hurry. So if, if that's the way some of this money could be spent, uh, I think it'd be terrific. Um, so I, I, we've already talked about one of my last questions about what's in the future, in next for transportation in the legislature. But if there's anything you want to add, anything else, it uh, doesn't have to be about my favorite subject, e-bikes uh, and e-scooters, but uh, anything else that, that you're looking at in the, the near to mid future in terms of transportation? Yeah, you know, along with um, everything we've been talking about for micromobility and new forms of transportation and, and cheaper ways to get around, <clears throat> just to throw something else into the mix, we've been working with electric aviation companies that are looking at, for example, aerial uh, Uber service um, from, from spot to spot that you just call on your phone and, you know, the thing comes is basically like a helicopter, but it looks like a drone, uh, much safer, almost silent, uh, come pick you up, take you where you want to go for about the same price per mile as you would take your current ride share. Um, it's, it's incredible, you know, and, and this stuff is like literally around the corner. I was just in California. Um, watching the demonstration for one of these take off and fly around and come and pick people up and all that. And um, Hawaii is perfect for this kind of thing. So not only going from, for example, the west side to downtown Honolulu in you know a matter of minutes compared to like an hour drive, uh, or from Oahu to uh, Maui, for example, um, these kind of opportunities are now real and they're here. And it's gonna revolutionize the way we get around on the much bigger scale than um, you know, some of the micro mobility that we've been talking about, but it all fits together in one big package. And that is fundamentally what's changing transportation and will ultimately change the way that all of us get around 
uh, I think for the better, you have a better, cheaper way to get around, way less traffic, way less cost, way less pollution, and ultimately a better quality of life. And that's something that I think we all should look forward to. And that's really what this is all about. I saw a presentation recently about Uber Eats working with a company called Neuro that is developing a driverless vehicle. So they've got a little van. It looks like a loaf of bread, of course. And uh, it's uh, marked Uber Eats on the side. And they can deliver 30 different meals to uh, to different people along a route uh, without a driver. You you go out to the vehicle, you tap in your number or you show them your your QR code or whatever it is, and the door opens and you uh, and you get your meal and the, the vehicle goes on and it's a safer driver than uh, than any of those pizza delivery guys, even the ones on the bike. So uh, I think we're looking at, a, at, a, at a, a lot of changes, which brings me to my last question for you. And that is, uh, as you know, California, it says no new ICE vehicles will be sold in the state uh, after 2035, ice meaning internal combustion engine gasoline. They're saying no more. Uh, you, you're not gonna be able, you can drive one if you got it. Uh, your old, you know, the Model T you've been fixing up in your garage, that's fine, but uh, no new cars are gonna be sold. And where do you, and now other states are looking at that. And I wonder where you think Hawaii is on that, uh, that trajectory. Yeah, you know, what's exciting is, um... That discussion in California so quickly moved to now New York and, and like half a dozen other states. This legislative session you're going to see um, in January of 2023, you're going to see these bills introduced all around the country. But frankly, you know, sort of where California and New York go, the rest of the country goes by default. Because uh, if you're a car company, you're building cars for, you know, to serve an entire market. And if 40 million people or 60 million people, if you include other states, or even up to you know 50% of the country, if all these states do this, um, go that, that direction, then the whole company um, business model and their products are going to change to fit that. So inevitably, we are moving toward um, uh, sort of the, the phase out of traditional gas uh, internal combustion engine vehicles faster than I think anyone ever imagined. And that won't, I think, at the end, be driven by government policy, but by simply better technology, innovation, cheaper products, and a public that is demanding better, cheaper electric vehicles at rates, you know, 30%, 40% increases each year, year over year. And that's something that the, the market um, and, and the companies in it can't ignore. So, so I see it as kind of inevitable uh, down the road. The question is, um, how do we put in the electric charging capacity to make sure that everybody can charge their electric cars? Because um, obviously if you live in condos or apartment buildings or things like that, um, you don't always have access. So it comes down to a, a justice and equity issue because if, if folks who live in single family homes tend to be in wealthier communities already have EVs, um, how do you make sure everyone else can access that too so that they can enjoy the cost of cheaper, the, uh, cheaper transportation as well? So that's really what part of this focus is with a lot of the um, federal money that's coming in right now for EV charging and infrastructure. Well, I live in a high rise and I, although I don't qualify as, uh, as low income, I, uh, I feel the the, uh, the lack of charging infrastructure uh, very acutely. I think we may get one in our building finally. It, it, a lot on this subject, it always bugged me that uh, some of the, the coolest looking electric vehicles that were coming out of what we used to call Detroit, and then not that they were actually made there, but they never could make it to Hawaii because California had the elect, had already had the air regulations and they could sell all these cars in California. And so we could never get our hands on them over here. So uh, we'll have to, we'll have to fix that up uh, while, along the way here, make sure we get our fair share. Oh yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I'm, I, I can't thank you enough. It's been a very interesting half hour I, for everybody else, I hope, but it was certainly it was for me. Senator Chris Lee, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, and, uh, you know, all the best, good sailing or whatever we call it in, the, in the, the next term of the legislature. And well, I guess there's a little election thing 
uh, between now and then, but eh, we, you know, we, okay, <laughs> well, we won't talk about that. But uh, I really want to thank you. I want to close, as I promised, with a micro mobility moment, uh, a bike bit, and I think we can put it on the screen. But there's an interesting video just along the lines of things we've been talking about about infrastructure. If you go to YouTube and you search for HBL Urban Core ride October 2020, uh, 2022, you will find a two and a half minute video uh, that the group, the advocacy group of the Hawaii Bicycling League put together where they rode around Ala Moana uh, area, rode around Kaka'ako, rode around uh, Kapiolani Park, pointing out the small things that could be done to improve the infrastructure uh, by expanding some of the, the, uh, the sidewalks or bike lanes, uh, by connecting bike paths that are not connected now. Um, it's a very interesting two and a half minutes and I encourage uh, you, Senator, if you haven't seen it and everybody else to take a look two and a half minutes of your time. Uh, HBL Urban Core uh, ride October 2022. And I will tell you that this has been the uh, two wheel revolution. Uh, we've had a great half hour with uh, Senator Chris Lee of the Committee on Transportation in the, in the State Senate. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a speaker, uh, Julie Thain, who is with the Rocky Mountain Institute. Uh, she is a, uh, her job is urban transformation. And she was also the MC at the recent Micromobility America conference. And, uh, but she was actually talking mostly, and that's what we want to talk to her about, about the, this equality issue, about making sure that uh, it's not just the rich folks that get the, uh, the benefits of micromobility. So I hope you'll be with us next week. I want to thank both my viewers. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for, for joining in. Uh, and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.